What's up, guys? Great to see you. I'm Pastor Tim. So happy you could join us for the last week of our series, Skeptics. Welcome. In fact, let's give a big welcome to our Live Locations Church Online. What's up, guys? So glad you came. Hey, here's a question. Have you enjoyed the series so far? I hope so. It's been eye-opening. We have been diving deep into the historical evidence to look at the global impact of the Christian faith. And to me, it's been inspiring, just kind of amazing to discover how many followers of Jesus Christ have been at the forefront of social transformation. Take a look at this mosaic. We've been working our way through this. At the forefront of every major social movement, you'll find Christians founding hospitals like Mary Mose and Johns Hopkins, ending slavery, Frederick Douglass, Harriet Tubman, William Wilberforce, all were passionate Christ followers who fought for racial justice and ended up abolishing open slavery. They pioneered medicine like Edward Jenner, the father of immunology. They started universities, Oxford, Cambridge, Princeton, Harvard, Yale, all founded by Christians to train students in the Bible. And they pioneered the scientific revolution. Isaac Newton, Blaise Pascal, we looked at last week, Johannes Kepler, all passionate followers of Christ whose scientific breakthroughs really brought our world out of the dark ages and into the light of science and technology. The reality is if you examine the historical evidence, Christ's followers have been at the vanguard, the forefront of social progress and led the way in making our world a better place. And there's still some of the sharpest minds in our world today. In fact, today you're going to hear from one of them. My friend, John Dickerson, is an award-winning journalist and author of the book, Jesus Skeptic, which I've been recommending to you. A journalist explores the credibility and impact of Christianity on which this series is based. Now, I met John last fall at a small leaders gathering, and I found out that he was an investigative journalist. I said, wow, interesting job, news reporter. And he described writing articles investigating the corruption of powerful people, exposing prison abuses. John has written investigative stories about meth labs. He's interviewed immigrants crossing the Arizona desert. And I was fascinated because he said, basically, Tim, I'm a professional skeptic. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, Tim, that's what a good journalist is trained to do. We're skeptics. We don't take things at face value. We investigate firsthand and we follow wherever the evidence leads. Well, today, John's going to share on a personal level about Jesus, you, and experiential evidence. We've looked at the sciences, history, social justice. That's well-documented objective evidence. But what about experiential evidence, like the testimonies of real-life people today? Well, John has interviewed just about everybody from millionaires to rock stars to addicts in a halfway house, and I think you'll be amazed by what he's found. As a millennial journalist, John has written for the New York Times, USA Today, and in 2014, he won the prestigious Livingston Award for young journalists given by ABC News. After he became personally convinced that Jesus launched the greatest movement for social good in human history, John has now dedicated his life to the cause. He actually became a Christian minister, and he serves as lead pastor at Connection Point Church in Indianapolis. So church, would you give a warm liquid welcome to my good friend and brother, John Dickerson. Thanks so much, Tim. Hey, Liquid Church, it is great to see you. I am so excited to be with you today. It's been a great joy in my life to get to know your lead pastor, Tim. Uh, I'm sure you know this, but behind the scenes, he is the real deal. I love your pastor, and I love your city. I've got a lot of great memories in New York City, especially as it relates to my journalism career. In fact, here's one of them. This is a picture of me over in Manhattan in the Yale Club, and I'm sitting next to a news icon who was really a lifetime hero for me as a journalist, Charles Gibson of ABC News. Uh, in this picture, you can see my beautiful wife. I was 28 years old, and I was receiving a National Journalism Award from Charles Gibson, as well as from Tom Brokaw. And I want to talk about that because at this point in my life, I had reached so many of my goals. And I want to talk with you today about your search for fulfillment uh, you see, when this picture was taken, I was in the pinnacle of success for my field as a journalist. I graduated at age 21 with my bachelor's degree in journalism. Uh, three years later, at age 24, in the state of Arizona, the press club for the state of Arizona, out of all the journalists in the state, had named me journalist of the year. 
Four years after that, I was sitting next to Charles Gibson as he and executives from the New York Times and NPR and the Chicago Tribune named me nationally a journalist of the year. And here's what I found. I got everything that I thought would fulfill me and I was still unfulfilled. Have you ever felt that way? Uh, Have you ever really gone for something and then you get it and you just realize you're thirsty for something more? And it wasn't just my career. I mean, you can see that I had a beautiful wife and my career was good. I had a nice house in Scottsdale, Arizona. In fact, as a car guy, I got to be on a thing called the press fleet. What this is, is auto manufacturers, every year when they produce new cars, they give a certain number to journalists. And because I was on the press fleet, this started when I was about 22, every week I could order up whatever car I wanted. A new Mercedes AMG, an Audi, a Range Rover. I could get whatever I wanted and get this, they would deliver it to my house with a full tank of gas. Here's what I learned in that season of my life. I learned that if I'm having a really good day and I'm driving a cheap economy car, it's still a really good day. And I also learned that if I'm having a really bad day and I slide into the seat of a $148,000 Mercedes AMG, it's still a really bad day. I had gotten everything I wanted, but I found that I was still thirsty for something more. I wonder, have you ever felt that way? Have you ever worked hard to get what you want, but you're still longing for something more? Maybe you thought having a baby, if I could have a child, that'll make me happy, and instead, all it's done is make you sleep deprived. Maybe you thought the promotion at work, that's the thing, that'll make me happy, and instead, all it's done is make you more stressed. Maybe you thought, oh, the bigger house, that's the thing. We'll get the bigger house, and now it's just more space to clean and maintain. Maybe you thought, if I could marry that amazing person, that will give me happily ever after, and you did, and then you learned that marriage is a lot of really hard work. Live long enough, and you will experience this universal feeling of a lack of fulfillment even after chasing fulfillment with everything you have. I wonder, would you like to discover how you can find a fulfillment that lasts? Would you like to discover how you can find a peace that lasts? Well, I wanna take you today into the definitive claim of Jesus. You see, Jesus didn't just claim that he can make your life a little better. Jesus claimed that he was God. And this is one of the unique things about Jesus. Of all the people in human history, he did not claim to just be a good teacher or a profound spiritual guru or someone who could help you improve your life. He claimed that he is almighty God. He claimed that he's the one who spoke the universe into existence and that he designed you and that he alone can fulfill you and that he freely offers that to you. These are radical claims from a real person who actually lived. And I found, as a skeptical journalist, I started at the very beginning, did this guy even live? And once I decided, okay, he lived, then I looked, can we know what he said? And once I, okay, these words are reliable, this is what he said, then I started to look at these words and I thought, this guy's either crazy or he's actually God. There's not really a lot of room in the middle because look what he says here in John chapter 10 to you. He says, I've come that you might have life and have it to the full. I mean, who else talks like that? Think about this. This is a real person. Can you imagine being at like a, a party with some friends and you sit down with a drink and some guy sits down next to you and he turns to you and says, hey, I've come that you might have life. And that you might have life to the full. You'd be like, what are you talking about? Jesus talked as if he's the creator of the universe. He claims that he's a source of fulfillment that never runs out. Listen to this in John 4. He put it this way. Whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst again. He's talking about this very thing that I was talking about with the press cars. Where it's like, man... 
It's fun to drive a new car every week and not have to pay anything for it, but there's something deeper. And we've all been there where you get the car or the house or whatever else, and then after a few months or a few years, it's like, well, what's next? And Jesus makes this claim. He says, if, if you will receive me into your life as God and experience me, you'll find the one source of water that you never thirst again. Radical claims but are they actually true? And that's what I want to encourage you to genuinely ask yourself today. Could Jesus give you a lasting fulfillment that nothing else and no one else can give to you? I spent probably, if you count my college years all the way through my journalism career, more than 10 years researching the existence of Jesus and then the ancient manuscripts. I'm such a nerd that I went and learned ancient Greek because I wanted to know, like, can we trust this thing that's called the Bible? Have they fiddled with the original language? And I'm such a nerd. I compiled so much evidence, and I found that it all falls into really three basic categories. There's ancient evidence. Ancient evidence would be things like Josephus and Suetonius and Tacitus, non-Christian writers of Jesus' era who described this Jesus of Nazareth who claimed to be God. And when I found those ancient writings and ancient artifacts, it affirmed to me the church didn't make up this Jesus guy. He clearly lived. And there's all sorts of ancient evidence, but then there's external evidence External evidence is really the human record from the time Jesus was born until now that we can measure objectively how he has impacted humanity. For example, every time you're filling out something online and you have to put in your birthday and it asks you the year that you were born, why does that year start with a 1900 or a 2000 when we know that humanity goes back far longer than that? Because the year zero on our calendar is the year when Jesus was born. I mean, that's how profound his impact is on our world, that every time an atheist writes their date, they're actually referencing Jesus. And there's all sorts of external evidence, and we'll get into that throughout this series. But today, I want to talk with you about something that I call internal evidence. Now, at first, internal might sound subjective. And in a sense, internal is subjective, but here's the thing, you're the subject, there are claims that Jesus makes that you'll never know if they're true or false unless you try them. For example, uh, in the word of God, God tells us this, you will seek me and you will find me if you search with all your heart. And I reached a point in my quest for fulfillment in my research of Jesus where I realized that yes, it is intellectually valid. Uh, some of the most brilliant people who've ever lived have been followers of Jesus. For example, Isaac Newton, Blaise Pascal, C.S. Lewis. You don't have to be dumb to believe in Jesus. It's intellectually valid. However, there comes a point where it has to move from the head to the heart. And I realized as I read these claims of Jesus that I'm never going to know for sure if they work or not unless I try them. Hey, here's what I mean. As a news reporter, I learned early on, right when I finished my undergrad, my first newspaper editor assigned me to write a story about skydiving in Arizona. He said, John, I don't want it to just be a human interest story. I want the statistics. What percentage of people die? How high do they bounce off the ground if their parachute doesn't open? That's how twisted my newspaper editor was, okay? Arizona is a skydiving mecca, and that's where I live. There's no clouds, and the weather's good. And so I did all this research, and he said, okay, John, now that you've done everything about, you know, the statistics, the facts, I want you to go and go skydiving yourself. And I want you to weave that into the story and describe what is it like. And I learned that as an investigative reporter, that there was the intellectual side to a story, but then there was the experiential side to every story. Uh, for example, whenever I was covering crime, no, I would not go and do the crime, if that's what you're thinking, okay? But I would have sources who would get me into the drug house where the heroin was sold so I could see it. I would ride along with the police officers who covered those beats. Why? Because there's part of any story that is fact, 
And there's part of any story that you've got to just be there to really know the truth of what's going on. And I reached this point in my investigation of Jesus where I needed to do a ride along. So I grew up in Michigan and we would often go camping up in Canada. And when we did, there was this massive lake up there called Lake Matanenda. And there's a waterfall, a stream that runs into the lake. It's probably considered a river here. And uh, it would vary in width depending on what year and how full the river was. This picture is a year where the river was a little bit lower and it wasn't as wide. But on one particular year, I was about nine years old and my three older brothers, they're all incredibly athletic. They're jocks. And I know what you're thinking. I did not get the gene, okay? I didn't get that gene. I, I got the nerd gene instead, okay? But we were at this waterfall. And as you can see in the picture, about halfway down, this waterfall goes down these stairs, and they're probably each, I don't know, six to ten feet high if you're up close to the waterfall there. And in the middle, there's this pool, and then the waterfall begins again. Well, we were uh, kind of fishing and setting up for a picnic, and one of my older brothers, incredibly athletic guy, decided at the top of the river, where the water looks very smooth, that he was going to inch his way across and just kind of demonstrate that he was stronger than the waterfall. I'll never forget because I saw him out of the corner of my eye. One minute I see him and the next I just hear this whoosh, whooshing noise. And I look back and he's gone. I mean like that, the, the waterfall had taken him down a number of those steps and in the middle where there's this big pool, the water's just, you know, going straight down. It's, it's burying and my other brothers, we run there, and we're waiting, like, is David's head going to pop up out of the water? And we keep waiting, and his head's not popping up. And now, if any of you are a youngest, and you grew up in a small home, and you always had to share a bedroom, you probably know what I was thinking at that moment. <laughs> it's true, I'm a terrible person. I was thinking, if he doesn't pop up, I'm going to get his bedroom. He did pop up and he lived and everything was fine. But here's the thing. My brothers and I, we will never again underestimate the power of moving water. We've learned that no matter how strong you are, if you step into a powerful current, the current is going to take you where the current is going. And it's a great picture because in life, we all get carried along by different currents. Sometimes we step into the current of popularity or the current of achievement, or the current of material possessions, or the current of relationship, and we think it's going to take us one place, but we don't realize it's taking us somewhere else. We all seek to be happy. We all seek to be at peace, but so often we find ourselves in these currents that are taking us out of happiness. They're taking us into anxiety, and it's like we can't even get out. You know, every drug addict who has ruined their life and their relationships and their career, they don't start off by saying, hey, I really want to ruin my life and family and career. They start off thinking, this feels good. This helps. And I know some other people can't control it, but I can. And the current's not going to take me where it takes everyone else. None of us, you know, plan to ruin our lives or plan to be unfulfilled, but there's all these raging currents. We step into the current of our dream career or our dream car or our dream partner, and a lot of those things are not bad things. They just don't take us where we thought they would take us. In my life, I spent a lot of years, really my college years, all through my 20s, looking at the different currents of life. I'm an analytical person, and I know it sounds nerdy and weird, but I kind of launched out at age 17 from my home of origin to just study like where, what path actually leads to fulfillment? What path am I going to choose for my life? And I figured instead of just trying them all, I could look at other people, let them get tossed around in the white water and decide what current leads where and then be intentional about what to step into. I know that's kind of analytical and nerdy, but that's part of my journey. Here's something I realized along the way. I'll never know for sure if the current of Jesus can carry me to fulfillment. I'll never know that for sure unless I get into it. 
There's so much that I can observe from the riverbanks, and, and I did a lot of observing from the riverbanks. Did this guy live? Has it, have his followers been good wherever they've gone around the world? Has it been generally a good thing for humanity? And then as I got to know followers of Jesus today, there was this fulfillment. There was this peace. But I got to a point where I realized I'm never going to know for sure unless I step in for myself. And here's what I want to ask you today. Could Jesus give you the fulfillment that nobody else and nothing else can? And the answer is you'll, you'll never know unless you try it. Could Jesus give you a peace, a peace that is with you in your uh, young years when you're looking for a spouse or those early fulfillment things, a, a peace that's with you in your retirement years when you're searching for identity and purpose, a peace that's with you even when you face the end of your life? You'll never know unless you try it. I want to tell you two stories, true stories, of people who gave everything they had in the pursuit of fulfillment. And as a reporter and a journalist, I had a front row seat to both of these stories. Now, when I would get assigned a profile like this, at the point I was at in my career as a journalist, I would spend months, sometimes three to six months, working on one story. It was very in-depth reporting. So when I was assigned a profile on a person, I kid you not, I would visit their childhood home. I would talk to friends they had in high school, talk to their ex-wives. I would talk to their business partners, to their neighbors. I want a 360 degree view. I had people I profiled where I would sleep on the couch in their living room so that I could document their morning routine. That's how messed up of a workaholic I was. But I found these two different guys who were both seeking fulfillment as much as you ever could, and they both tried every imaginable way to find fulfillment. The first is a man named Scott Coles. Scott is a man who built a fortune of nearly $1 billion. Now, if you need a math refresher, you hear so much billion, trillion, million stuff in the news. What does it all mean anymore? Okay, here's a billion. I just want you to imagine for a moment that I give you a million dollars today. You're welcome. Come back next week, okay? A million dollars, multiply that by a hundred. You're set for multiple lifetimes now. Multiply that by 10. Now you're talking about a billion dollars. At age 42, Scott Coles had amassed a fortune of one billion dollars. He had homes in Phoenix, in Aspen, in San Diego. Most of these homes were compounds, really. Uh, in Phoenix, for example, the, the wealthiest area is called Camelback Mountain. And Scott would buy up neighboring mansions on Camelback Mountain, and he would tear them down so that he could build, and he did build, an 18-hole golf course in his front yard. I saw Scott Cole's garage, Rolls-Royce, Bentley, Ferrari. I'm talking vintage Ferrari. My goodness. He had a beautiful wife. He had healthy children. And then as they got into their early 40s and he wanted a more beautiful wife, he went to Las Vegas and he picked the prettiest showgirl that he could find. And he divorced his wife and he married the prettiest girl he could find. Anything that a person would ever think that might make me happy, that could make me happy. He did it. He tried it. He amassed it. And at age 42, in the prime of his life with beautiful, healthy kids, having everything that so many people think brings joy, Scott Coles ended his own life intentionally. He just couldn't go on living. And as I interviewed his kids and his ex-wife and his high school friends, and they said he was a nice guy. He was a caring guy. He was a generous guy. It led me to this conclusion. Many roads marked fulfillment turn out to be life-devouring dead ends, or worse, drop-offs. That's why my heart for you in this series, even if you don't believe in God yet, is this. Be intentional about the currents that you place yourself in in life. Don't be random about it. Don't just step into the currents that are closest to you. Look at where the current leads other people. And I remember I was still driving the press cars at that time and thinking, oh my goodness, if that guy got all those things and felt like life wasn't worth living, 
then I probably shouldn't get in the current of thinking that material things will bring me ultimate fulfillment because I'll never get a fraction of what that guy had. And if that didn't work for him, it's clearly not going to work for me. I've never been the same since seeing firsthand a man who had everything that people would think brings happiness, or at least some sense of peace, but he was so hopeless that he ended his own life. What a tragedy. It led me to ask about my life. What am I really hoping will carry me to fulfillment? I mean, if nothing else in this series, maybe this will be a life-defining moment for you wherever you are in your journey to just kind of zoom out from social media and family drama and workplace drama and everything else in the news and just think about your life. Like, what are you, what current are you in? What do you think will bring fulfillment? Because we all think something will, but we rarely sit down to actually write it out. And if you were to write it out, you might be surprised. Well, as I was wrestling with this for my own life, uh, having seen the intellectual evidence of Jesus and having seen followers of Jesus changing the world, I profiled another person who had given everything in the pursuit of happiness and fulfillment. This guy had a totally different life. Grammy-winning musician. I spent about three months interviewing him and his daughter. During that time, his videos, music videos were still playing on MTV. He had millions of dollars in the bank. He had had investments all around California. But he described to me that his life had been completely miserable. In fact, while I was profiling him and spending that time with him, he described to me in detail different times where he and his wife were both high on meth. And they would get into these violent physical altercations while they were under the influence of that drug. He described to me a time where he looked down at his knuckles and he saw his wife's blood on his own knuckles because they had been fighting so aggressively. He described another time where a a number of famous musicians and artists had come over to his house for a huge party and there was a lot of drugs and a lot of pleasure. And he woke up in the morning and he went out to the pool and his two-year-old daughter was curled up on a towel right by the edge of the pool, and she had slept there all night. And even through the drug brokenness of his mind, he just realized, my life is a mess. But he had gotten there by going after fame, getting it, fortune, getting it, achievement, getting it, possessions, got it, experiences, he tried it all. And it just led him lower and lower into this darkness. There was a key moment in Brian's life story where on an Easter Sunday morning, he walked into a church a lot like this near Bakersfield, California. His brain still half functioning from drug addiction, broken in life from the pursuit of fulfillment, currents that had beaten him up. And he doesn't remember everything from that Easter message, but he remembers these words of Jesus, where Jesus says to you and me, come to me, all of you who are weary, all of you who are burdened, and I will give you rest. What a claim from the guy who claims to be God, the guy who claimed to knit you together in your mother's womb. And here's why Brian's story has such a different ending than Scott Cole's story. See, Scott Cole's never gave Jesus a try. From all the people I talked to, he just never considered it. He ridiculed it from the riverbanks like I used to do, but he never tried it for himself. Brian said, hey, I've tried everything else. I might as well try this Jesus thing. And on that Easter Sunday, he chose to give it a try. And he called out a prayer, God, if you're there, I believe. Jesus, if you're there, I need this. You say you give rest to the weary. You help the burdened. If you're there, I need that. And all he did with, I mean, a a childlike mentality through that brain confused by drugs, said, God, if you're there, I want your help. Jesus, if this is true, 
I need you in my life. And part of Brian's story is that then within about two months, after having been a drug addict really since high school, he had started with marijuana in high school, and it had just kept leading him deeper and deeper all the way to heroin and meth. He'd been a drug addict for more than 10 years, and within three months, he was sober. And that's the part as a journalist when I heard that, I thought, no, no, that does not happen. I'm going to spend three months with this guy, and I'm going to find out the truth. And the truth, as I hung out with Brian and his daughter, who was in late elementary at that time, was that he had totally transformed. That he had changed from the inside out. He had intentionally given away a lot of the wealth. He didn't need that stuff anymore. Brian Welch found in Jesus something that he couldn't find anywhere else. And I saw firsthand with my own eyes, what a contrast from the billionaire who didn't have Jesus and ended up taking his own life. One day, Brian and I were at a P.F. Chang's in Scottsdale, Arizona, and he looked across the table at me, and this is what he said. I had my tape recorder rolling. He said this, I had $3 million in cash sitting in the bank. All the cars I wanted, a $200,000 pool. I don't know how that's even possible, but apparently it is. Nannies, the nicest house, real estate in California, and I was miserable. I mean, just think about that for a moment. Nothing wrong with a $200,000 pool if you have the money and you want to spend it that way. But if you think it's going to bring you fulfillment, be smart enough to look at other people who've gone down that current. What a shame it would be to work your entire life and get into your 60s or 70s or 80s and look back and be like, I gave everything. I only got a fraction of what these other guys got, and I could have known from the beginning that wasn't going to fulfill me. But I love what Brian said after that. He says, then I found God and was like, this is all I've ever wanted. I didn't find what I was looking for in all that stuff. You know, if you're seeking fulfillment and inner rest, you're the kind of person who Jesus invites and helps. And I want to be clear, there's nothing wrong with these other things that can fulfill to a level. God wants you to have a rich and full life, but the deepest fulfillment isn't found in getting outside things and bringing them in. It's found in connecting to the creator of the universe internally and then having a source of joy and fulfillment that kind of bubbles up from within through all the different seasons of life, through all the economic ups and downs and relational ups and downs. And I just wonder, where have you been exhausted in your hunt for fulfillment? Where have you maybe been let down in your quest or your search for fulfillment? Where has your soul been full of anxiety rather than rest? You can come to Jesus today in the same simple way that Brian Welch did on that Easter Sunday. Well, I want to tell you about just one other person. This is a skeptic, and it's a totally different personality profile, because you might be listening and thinking, okay, John, interesting stories, helpful to know, but I really don't expect millions of dollars or worldwide fame to make me happy. Maybe you're more like me. Those things have never been options for me, okay? But, you know, I'm a pretty good guy. Part of my story before I became a fully devoted follower of Jesus, I didn't go on some drug binge. I, you know, graduated from college early and I worked hard and I did all the right things. But I found that still I was lacking something. And so wherever you find yourself on that spectrum of what you're pursuing for fulfillment, I've found the same thing to be true that I found in Jesus something that's not available anywhere else. And this next guy I want to talk to you about is a person who maybe you can relate to because he was a good guy. He kept most of the rules. He wasn't addicted to anything. He even believed that Jesus existed. In fact, he'd seen Jesus with his own eyes. But this whole thing that Jesus is God and could meet his deepest needs, he was not buying that. He was a skeptic in that sense. Uh, in fact, this guy got so annoyed with Jesus claiming to be God that he would make fun of Christians. He would even harm Christians. 
he would go around and mess with the Christians. This guy, his name was Saul. But eventually he would have an encounter with Jesus where Jesus showed himself to be God. And it so transformed him that he then became a follower of Jesus. And he then went around telling everyone, even when he would get imprisoned for it or whipped for it or beaten for it, Jesus is God. Jesus is the fulfillment that you seek. And here's how he put it in one of his letters, which is recorded in the New Testament. He says in Romans 1.16, I am not ashamed of the gospel. What's the gospel? Very simply, it is the good news that the God who made you loves you, that he came into this world as the person of Jesus, and he willingly died on the cross to pay the penalty for your mistakes and mine, and that you can be made right with God, not by doing a bunch of good things, but by simply believing and admitting your need that you need Jesus' help. And if you believe in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, you will be saved. That's the gospel. And this guy who was a skeptic, a hardened skeptic, and who hated Christians, would become so transformed that he wrote, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Why not? Because it's the power of God. And that's what I've found in my life. The good news of Jesus connects you to the actual power of God. You can have the power of God in your life. And it's a power that leads to salvation. So that you know when your body dies, You're going to spend eternity in heaven with God. But not only that, it leads to freedom in this life and fulfillment. And this path, this current, it's available to everyone. God so loved the world that he sent his only son so that whoever believes in him will be saved. It's available to you today. But the question for you is this, will you try it? Will you get in the current? Because it brings salvation to everyone who believes. From my own experience, I would say, and I think from Saul the skeptic's experience, your belief does not have to start out as a perfectly mature, fully formed belief. That's not how we're born, right? Wouldn't that be the weirdest thing? Like you're looking on Instagram and some mom has a baby and she's holding this like 48-year-old dude with a beard. Right, like we, we start a, as babies and we grow and we mature. You don't have to have every question about, you know, the history of the universe and every book of the Bible. You don't have to have all that stuff answered to say, God, I believe that you love me and you made me and I want this fulfillment. I want this relationship with you. You start there and then he feeds you and he grows you. That's been my experience anyway. Jesus invites you to find fulfillment and rest in him. So three very simple questions as we close today. First, have you ever really tried belief in Jesus for your own fulfillment? Have you ever really tried it? Maybe you were raised as a Christian. You've even been coming to church. and You're like, yeah, I'm a Christian. But have you ever actually really said, this is what I'm putting my, my faith in to fulfill me? Have you ever really tried it? For your fulfillment and, more importantly, for your eternal life. Second question for you today. Have you forgotten Jesus in your search for fulfillment? Have you maybe just been sampling the things that are around you rather than being intentional to say, where will this path take me? Maybe you're here and you're a believer and you just needed this reminder today that all those other things, and they might not be bad things, but they're not going to fulfill you the way that Jesus can. And then the third question I want to ask you today. Will you invite someone who needs fulfillment? Every day in your neighborhood, in your workplace, in your family, you're encountering people just like that 42-year-old billionaire, Scott Coles. People who are desperate in their search for fulfillment. And apart from Jesus, they're not going to find what they were created to experience. And Liquid Church, you've got an amazing church to invite people to. You've got an amazing pastor, an amazing movement of God. And so if you're here and you're finding new life in Jesus, invite the people you work with. Invite the people you live with. Invite the people in your neighborhood because church, the people around us, desperately need the good news of Jesus.
The people around us are caught up in the currents of life and they're getting pashed in the white rapids against the rocks of life. They need the hope. They need the fulfillment. Well, wherever you are in your faith journey, I just want to pray for you today. I want to give you an opportunity to believe in Jesus, to call out to him, whether for the first time or as a return to him. And I'll encourage you, if you're not sure where you're at spiritually, there was a time in my life I didn't know if God existed, but I said, God, if you're there, I want to experience you. Let me pray for you right now. Would you join me in prayer? Father, I ask right now for every person listening across every Liquid Church campus and those online as well. Lord, you're stirring in hearts. And God, I I pray the prayer of the man who came to you, who said, Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief. God, for every skeptic, for every doubter, for every weary traveler, I pray, Lord, that you'd help their unbelief. I pray that you would plant seeds of faith in us. And Lord, that with our will, each of us would reach out to you and just say, Jesus, I choose to believe you. Lord, for all of us who found new life in you, would you remind us today that you're the source of life and satisfaction? And Lord, would you use us in these next six days to invite our friends, our neighbors, our loved ones to join us at Liquid Church and be part of what you're doing. We pray it all in Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for watching the Liquid Church YouTube channel. Hey, don't stop here. I wanna invite you to be part of our online community. Subscribe to this channel so you don't miss a single video or live stream and share this with a friend. You know, everybody's welcome to join us. If you were blessed by this message, you can support our ministry by clicking the Give Now button to help us continue to reach people around the world for Christ. Thanks so much for watching. God bless.